Um, I, I'm slightly nervous about this title, so I would like to, before I start, I would like to say how many people in the room have, know what I mean when I say <coughs> the throttling effect? Can I have a show of hands? One. Good. Then I have rediscovered it. Uh, I was slightly nervous that uh, I would mention it and everyone would say, we know what you're talking about. And um, this is something that, that I came across uh, in the process of my, my PhD studies uh, over 10 years ago now. Um, and my colleague Francesco, uh, who did his PhD much more recently than, the, than myself, he uh, also midway through his studies happened upon some old papers. And, and, and both of us had the same experience of, why has no one told us about this before? Um, and so we, you know, and, and we've presented occasionally, uh, and people have said, well, we've never heard this before, but it's obvious. Um, and so I, I set a, a master's student uh, on his uh, final year project last year, uh, Arnas, um, to, to do some CFD modeling um, to demonstrate this, this effect, just in case uh, <laughs> nobody believes me that's a real effect. Because this is something we knew in the past, um, and then we seem to have forgotten about. And as I say, it was about just over 10 years ago, uh, I, uh, actually 10 years ago about now, I just submitted my PhD thesis. Um, but slightly more than 10 years ago, I was looking at the question of um, what effect does ventilation have uh, on fire behavior in tunnels? And that was the question that uh, was the central focus in my thesis, and uh, indeed there's a chapter on it in the handbook in Tunnel Fire Safety as well. Um, but I looked back into the literature, and the further back in the literature, it seemed to be a question that no one had really asked. But I got back to the early 70s and the 60s, and I suddenly discovered that the question that people were asking was the other way around. They weren't asking what effect does ventilation have on fire. They were almost entirely concerned with what effect does fire have on my ventilation. And I thought that was funny, so I, I, I looked up, and I, I discovered that if you go back into the 60s, there are some things we know. There are some things we knew back then. So, we go into the, not out of, in perhaps in the tunnel literature, but we go into the mine literature. So mine tunnels, uh, you know, mine ventilation was a, uh, an important thing. There was a lot of mining done, a lot of it's died since, uh, uh, certainly in the UK, mining has died since the 60s. But um, back then, we knew things about how flow uh, operates uh, in mine tunnel networks. So if we have a system like this, there's two branches, we have some longitudinal flow through that. Anecdotally, in the 1960s, we knew that if there was a fire <coughs> in one of these branches, we see the flow reduced through this branch, uh, and the flow increased through that branch. Um, and what they, they also knew was that if you had a small fire, that was the case. If you had a bigger fire, um, that would tend to dominate what happens here, and you would find that you actually sometimes got flow reversal uh, in these branches. So we actually... Uh, the dominant flow may have been away from the fire uh, and the flow roundabout, the flow redistributed because there was a fire somewhere in the network. Uh, and this became known as the throttling effect because uh, essentially what it felt like to the tunnel system as a whole uh, was that someone somewhere where the fire was had crushed the tunnel and they'd taken a big tunnel and they'd made a, a small constricted tunnel, a throttling it kind of throttled it, uh, and so it became known as the throttling effect. Um, and so this was this was well known in the uh, in the sixties. Um, effectively, fires make tunnels smaller <coughs> than they actually are, um, and that effect was greater for larger fires. And as I say, that's the throttling effect. Um, and through the 70s, there were a number of uh, research projects, mostly done in mine tunnels, which may be why uh, things haven't necessarily made its way into uh, the, the sort of transport tunnel market. But, um, for example, this paper in 1979 was kind of, uh, um, when Francesco came across it, it was the, the solution to all his problems. Uh, he discovered um, a series of experiments done uh, at model scale um, that demonstrated the effect that showed... Um, the size of the effect, you know, um, the, the relationship between fire size and effect of throttling, um, and, and fully described the throttling effect. Um, so the problem, in by 1979, the problem had been thoroughly investigated, 
Um, it was well understood, and it was published in, in a fairly respected journal, Combustion Science and Technology, well-respected, uh, well-established journal. Have any of you read that paper? <coughs> One. One person in the room has read that paper. Uh, it's a great paper. I recommend it to you. It's kind of hard to get, but it's out there. Um, what happened next is probably the reason why most of you haven't heard of it. Because someone called Bill Kennedy uh, and his colleague came along, uh, and they used all that data um, from the test that had been done by Lee uh, and so on in the, in the, in the 70s, uh, and they used all that data in this analysis paper, um, which they published uh, in 1982, um, and, and this paper is famous, it's the famous Danziger and Kennedy paper that has the relationship for critical ventilation velocity. Um, and the practical outcome of that is that almost everyone since then has cited this paper, um, and hardly anyone cites Lee uh, anymore, which is a shame. Uh, and I suspect, actually, as I say rather cheaply at the bottom of the slide here, um, that a number of people are citing this paper without ever having read it, because it is kind of hard to get your hands on these days. But I still see regularly in the tunnel literature references to this Danziger and, uh, and Kennedy uh, paper. And, uh, uh, I'm, sell I'm, I'm kind of selling Lee's work here, but I, I wish there was more references to Lee out there because it's a, uh, a much more sort of complex uh, system that just comes down to the question of critical velocity. Um, so, uh, as we, we get closer to the present day, into the 1990s, um, as Hooker said at a, a conference that, that it was at a few years ago, at the IFSS conference in uh, Karlsruhe in Germany, uh, he said, critical velocity for longitudinal tunnels is the single most well-investigated fire phenomena found in the tunnel fire research literature. Uh, and I'm sure none of you will actually disagree with that statement. Um, every conference I've been to on tunnel fires, someone has stood up and talked about back clearing critical ventilation velocity. Um, the session here this morning, there were two or three papers that actually the focus was on back clearing length critical ventilation velocity. Um, we know all about that. Um, and this, uh, in, in my opinion, is probably the most uh, sort of central paper that's ever been published uh, on <coughs> uh, critical ventilation velocity and, and smoke control. Um, and in this paper is the first time that we really established the supercritical ventilation velocity. Um, this is a, a, it's expressed non-dimensionally, but uh, this is essentially the, the, the critical ventilation velocity uh, against a uh, heat release rate. Uh, and we find that as fires get bigger um, in tunnels, um, there's a relationship between the velocity we need to control of the smoke uh, and the fire size. But once we reach a certain size, um, that uh, relationship breaks down. So for any larger fire, we only need to achieve the same ventilation velocity. So uh, in many tunnels out there, typical two-lane road tunnel, we're usually aiming for a flow of about three meters a second, three, three and a half sometimes. Um, if we can achieve that, it doesn't really matter what size the fire is, we can control all the smoke. Are you familiar with that concept? Yeah. Um, so when I first joined the, these tunnels, uh, I'm just realizing it's 15 years since I, I went to my first tunnel fires conference, um, what I, I witnessed over, over a series of many conferences, especially when people were presenting CFD models, um, the industry thinking seems to be, oops, sorry, um, if we can achieve the supercritical ventilation velocity in our tunnel, we can have smoke control for any fire. And we now have these models that are able to model them. So I, I saw, particularly 10, 15 years ago, a number of presentations, uh, CFD showing what's going on in a tunnel. Um, and the way they modeled it was they had a fire of some variety, um, and they had a, a a fixed velocity boundary condition. So we, if we have the critical ventilation velocity coming into the domain, um, then we can demonstrate that smoke's controlled for every um, fire. Uh, and we can do whatever we want with the fire. This boundary condition remains the same. And we've completely forgotten about the throttling effect that says actually longitudinal flow is affected by fire size. In that scenario, if you're modeling in that scenario, because you're imposing the boundary condition, a 10 megawatt fire, 20 megawatt fire, 100 megawatt fire, they all see the same flow. But in reality, 
if you've got real jet fans or real axial fans or whatever, real fan system, a 10 megawatt fire and a 100 megawatt fire will see different <coughs> flow rates. We forgot all about the throttling effect. Uh, and I've more or less <laughs> um, explained this slide uh, with the previous slide. But in practice, ventilation devices don't give a longitudinal flow. They create pressure, and that pressure is what moves the air. And if the fire resists the pressure, then we get slower flow. Um, and that was well demonstrated in the 1970s. And we forgot. And we ended up with a situation where we may have a tunnel fire design done on the basis of a 50 megawatt fire. We have Four jet fans, that's all we need to get critical ventilation velocity for the 50 megawatt fire. What happens if you have an 80 megawatt fire? Your fans are not strong enough because the fire resists the flow. So in case you don't believe me, um, actually, uh, it's not, that's being slightly cheeky, but... Um, so I sent uh, one of our students working on the problem just to demonstrate this effect clearly. Um, so we had a very simple scenario. A rectangular tunnel, um, only 100 or 150 meters long, depending on the, uh, the simulations that we were doing at the time. Um, and we had a, a bank of jet fans, seven jet fans side by side. I know this is an entirely unrealistic situation. Uh, this is not meant to model reality, this is to demonstrate an effect. Um, but instead of imposing a ventilation flow at the end of the domain, we had a free, free pressure boundary, uh, and we imposed the flow by the fans that were modeled within the domain. Um, and for each fire modeled, uh, we started the simulation with all the jet fans on, um, and we progressively switched them off until we start to see back layering uh, going against the, uh, the flow. I think in all the simulations we, we had a, uh, a boundary two meters upstream of the burner, and as soon as smoke was seen going through that, we thought, okay, we've got back layering. So it was, there was a two-meter uh, uncertainty in there. Um, and so here's the results. Um, and this is really all I wanted to present today. Um, we have a graph here um, showing fires of different heat release rates um, from 10 megawatts up to 90 megawatts. Um, there is the, the critical ventilation velocity that we require um, expressed on this axis. So you, you can see for this tunnel as modeled, it was about uh, three and a third meters a second required to control the smoke for all fires above 30 megawatts. Um, and yet, as we went through our simulations, uh, we only required three fans to control smoke from a 30 megawatt fire. We needed four if it was a 40 megawatt fire. We needed five fans uh, for 50, 60, and 70 megawatt fires, uh, six fans for an 80 megawatt fire, uh, and seven fans for a 90 megawatt fire. So I hope that single slide demonstrates the throttling effect. If we had had a design fire and done all our design calculations on the basis of a 50 megawatt fire, and so we design everything on the basis that we only need five fans, because that generates enough flow. Um, and maybe we have a sixth fan for redundancy, you know, because that's it's always good to have redundancy in your system. And then in reality, we have a 90 or 100 megawatt fire happening. We will not achieve smoke control because we don't have the seventh fan. So in conclusion, um, all I say is that by focusing on critical ventilation velocity for the past 20 years, uh, we may have forgotten some uh, aspects of, of fluid flow in, in tunnels uh, that are actually important. Um, and when you're designing, don't just design on the basis of a critical ventilation velocity. Please remember the throttling effect. Um, I'd like to thank Arnas and Francesco, who actually did all the work. I'm just the guy presenting. Um, and also some of my colleagues at Imperial College uh, and the University of Edinburgh, uh, who had uh, some very interesting uh, comments along the way. Thank you for your attention.